Hello, um, my name is Anastasia Bendukidze. I am the partner and director of the Knowledge Fund. Um, and I am really pleased to join Craig Riddle today, um, that he has agreed to join us, <laughs> better said, um, to give a talk on Ayn Rand's theory of rights. Um, Last week, we had a really interesting talk from Yaron Brook, who is a, somewhat a colleague of uh, Craig's on morality of capitalism. And there was a brief mention on how um, there is a, in society, we have to sacrifice. It, it, it is considered that if you want to be a good person, you should sacrifice. You know, you, yes, you work hard, but you also have to, you can't just enjoy your life. And um, I think Ayn Rand was sort of the first one who has asked, well, wh why? Why do I have to do that? And um, she was all about freedom, and uh, she was all about how if you leave the person alone, alone and let them be, and I think lots of amazing, <laughs> wonderful things will <laughs> come out of that. Um, our university is called Free University because of that. And uh, our motto is Zodna, Shrama, Tawisopleba, which translates as knowledge, work, and freedom. And we really try to encompass that freedom in our day-to-day -day studies. And I hope, as students of this university, you feel that. Um, Actually, we have um, a separate section at our library, which is d dedicated to Ayn Rand and to libertarian movement. So um, no. make sure to check it out. Well, everyone is free to take it. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your lecture because I think that you will open our eyes <laughs> to many wonderful things that Ayn Rand had to share that you have um, gathered in your lecture. Thank you very much. And. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at Free University. I love the name of this university, especially that it, it stands for Freedom University, not free as in, hey, anybody can come for free. Somebody else will pay for it kind of thing. So what a great place. And uh, I love the motto, too, knowledge. Uh, what is it? It's knowledge, freedom, and work, or knowledge, work, freedom, I think it was, which is, is a fabulous order, actually. That's going to tie right into what I want to talk about tonight. The title of my talk, again, is Ayn Rand's Theory of Rights. Uh, for those of you who might not know, Ayn Rand is a famous American novelist philosopher who wrote the novels Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead and some nonfiction works, including Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and uh, the virtue of selfishness. Um, so uh, we'll get into her ideas, but I want to begin with, uh, with freedom, as, as uh, the school is named after freedom, and I'd like to talk about whether or not uh, freedom is good. Is freedom a good thing? Should people be free? Now, by freedom, we mean free to live their lives according to their own judgment, to act on their own uh, judgment, and to engage with others voluntarily. So there's no force involved, right? The idea is we're free, we can do our thing, and if there's a government, great, that government just protects our freedom. That's the kind of freedom that I'm talking about here, because almost anybody would say, yes, we're for freedom. So I want to specify that. Is that a good thing? Yeah. And, is it sh so, and, and so should people be free? Another way of saying it. And the answer, I think, we would agree is yes. Notice, though, when we say that freedom is good or that people should be free, that we are using moral terms. Good and should are moral terms. Now, obviously, freedom is a political context. It, it, it's a situation where there's an absence of force. Um, so there's a political element of it, but when we say that people should be free, we're also including a moral element. And this is a really important cue as to how to think about freedom and what we need to understand in order to support it, advance it, or defend it. So I want to burrow down into this a little bit. And to be really clear, so if you say people should be free, it sounds political, especially if you put the emphasis on free. But if you put the emphasis on should, we definitely have a moral term. 
people should be free. Okay, if people should be free, then there must be some moral principle by reference to which they should be free. Things are right or wrong, good or bad, or we should or shouldn't do things by reference to a moral principle. It's, you know, as soon as you use the word should or good, you're talking about some underlying principle that says, yeah, that's, that's right according to this principle. So what is the principle by reference to which freedom is good or people should be free? There must be a moral principle there. Now, traditionally, the moral principle in question is the principle of rights. The principle of rights. The idea behind the principle of rights is that you have a right, as the American founders put it, to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. These, said the American founders, are the fundamental rights. And they're not the only ones who said this, but they built a whole country on this idea, so it was a pretty, pretty big deal. The right to life is the right to act in accordance with the requirements of your life. That's the fundamental right, according to them. The right to liberty is the right to act on your judgment, free of coercion. Liberty and coercion are opposites, right? The right to property is the right to keep, use, and dispose of the products of your effort. If you make a bowl by digging you know, er, uh, clay out of the ground, then that bowl belongs to you, according to, this, according to this theory. And the right to the pursuit of happiness is the right to pursue the goals and values that will fill your, your life with joy. So this is the theory, that we have rights, and that's why you should be free. You have a right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. There's the theory. But there's another question. Are rights real? Or are they made up? Because if they're just made up, we don't have much. We just have the assertion, hey, I have a right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, so you can't use force against me. And what if somebody says, well, I don't think you have rights. You're just saying you have rights. So we have a problem if we don't have an answer to the question, are rights real and how do we know it? Now, what are the traditional answers to the question, are rights real? And where do they come from? There are essentially three. Rights come from God. Rights come from government or rights come from nature. We'll take these one at a time. So if rights come from God, what do you have to prove first in order to prove that you have rights? That God exists. Now this is a very tall order to say the least, and no one has proven that God exists. This is why all religions count on the concept of faith, and as faith being a virtue, so that you can accept the existence of God when there is no evidence for his existence. The reason we have the two concepts, reason and faith, is precisely because reason says, go by evidence and logic, and faith says, there are certain things you should accept just on faith, without evidence and logic. They're literal opposites. So, if rights come from God and you have to prove that God exists, and you can't prove that God exists, so you're just going to say you have to go by faith, you're really throwing the whole thing to the wind. You have nothing. There, there's, no, there's no way to support that. Moreover, somebody might say, well, my God says I should cut your head off if you don't believe in my religion. And he says, and I have faith that that's true. So what do you, I mean, you're, you're just at loggerheads. This is just a war of each against all based on faith. So that's not going to work. The second theory, the idea that rights come from government, is equally problematic. So the idea that rights come from government means the government tells you what you can do and that's what you have a right to do, and they tell you what you can't do and that's what you have a right not to do, right? So basically, to put it very bluntly. Well, if this is the case, then any government can tell you what to do. Those are your rights. So you, if you live in Nazi Germany and they say, your right as a Jewish person is to go into this oven and die. If you live in, in North Korea today, uh, they can say, well, your right is to do what the government tells you to do, and we tell you you're going to live in accordance with our dictates or you're going to go into a, a prison uh, or, we'll, or we'll kill you, and so on and so forth. You see the problem here. A, it's just turning the idea of rights into law. 
Rights and laws are not the same concept. That's why we have two different words for them, just like we have different words for reason and faith. Laws are precisely what a government says you may and may not do. But the thing about laws is they can be legitimate or illegitimate. The idea of rights is that it's more fundamental than law and government. And the whole point of the concept of rights, whether they exist or not, the point of the concept is to inform us about which laws are, are legitimate and which governments are legitimate, which kind of government's activities are legitimate. So laws and, and rights are different levels in, in sort of a hierarchy that you can think of. Right are more fundamental than laws, and the purpose of rights, as the American founders put it, governments are formed not to create rights, but to secure rights. So the rights pre-exist government, that's the idea. So to say that you know, rights come from government is to equate rights and laws, and it's to bastardize the language. It's to, it's to misuse the concept of rights. It's to, it's to raise it to a level where it doesn't belong and deny its fundamentality. So that's a problem. Now the third idea that rights come from nature sounds really good. Who likes the sound of that, right? We can find this in nature. That's great. Unfortunately, there are problems with this idea too. If I say, well, rights come from nature, and you say, great, where are they? You cut me open, are they in here? If I start looking around out here, are they out there? What does it mean that rights come from nature? Well, historically, the answer to this question is also problematic. The history of rights theory is infused with this idea that rights come from nature. John Locke had this idea, the American founders had this idea. Uh, 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 theor theorists uh, earlier than Locke, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Puf Pufendorf, and others had this idea. It dates all the way back, frankly, to uh, ancient Rome and ancient Greece to some extent. Cicero talked about rights. So th it's, a, it's an ancient concept, and the idea that, that rights come from nature is very sexy. But most of that history is, uh, is essentially this. So we'll take John Locke as the paramount example because he's the most famous natural rights theorist, and he's also the theorist who the American founders drew from to, to develop their theories and create the United States. So John Locke says that we have rights and that they come from nature. And then if you were to say, well, where in nature do they come from? He says, well, there's a natural moral law, and your rights come from that natural moral law. Well, where does that natural moral law come from? God. According to Locke, the natural moral law, by reference to which you have rights, comes from God. Indeed, he says in his second treatise, his most famous work, in which he discusses rights, that the reason that I may not use force against you is because you don't belong to me, you belong to God. This is his, one of his arguments for why you have rights, is that you're God's property, not my property. So I can't ask you to do my bidding or force you to do my bidding. You're to do God's bidding. So again, on this theory of natural rights here, we've come back around to a theory that is not natural rights, it's supernatural rights. We've gotten nowhere, because you still now have to prove that God exists in order to prove that you have rights that come from God. So the problem with the natural rights theory historically not just the word natural, the word natural is great depending on how you use it, but if by natural you mean supernatural, we've gotten nowhere. It's just supernatural rights or God-given rights once removed. So this gets us absolutely nowhere. So there are the three theories of rights. And the question remains, are rights real? If so, how do we know it and where do they come from? That's the bad news. It's a difficult question. The good news is I'm going to give you an answer tonight that I think you're going to find very interesting and satisfying and that hopefully will, will wet your whistle to go look further into this. We're going to look at Rand's approach to rights, which is just completely different. So she takes the idea of rights as essentially what the founders said. You have a right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the theory. The idea is that you have 
the, you should have the freedom to act in accordance with the requirements of your life, that you have, should have the freedom to act in accordance with your judgment, not uh, to be coerced by others, and that you have the right to uh, produce and keep and use the product of your effort. So all of these things are verbs. Act as your life requires. Act in accordance with your judgment, not coercion. Produce, keep, use the product of your effort. All verbs. So this is the theory that Ayn Rand is taking as the idea of rights, because there's this other idea that you have a right to f goods and services. But that's just self-contradictory, because if, if I have a right to medicine, then somebody has to be forced to give me medicine. We can talk about that kind of thing in, in the Q&A. But just for the record, the theory that Rand is working with here is, the, is, is essentially Locke's conception, that you have a right to act on your judgment, and the founder's conception. So in asking the question, do we have these things, Ayn Rand wants to get clear on some terms. We're already clear on what the idea of rights is supposed to be. So do you have rights? Do I have rights? Well, what are we? We're human beings. All right, what kind of animal is a human being? What is the essential nature of this being that we're asking about whether we have rights? And Rand looks at human beings, and she takes a very Aristotelian approach. Aristotle called man the rational animal. And by that, he did not mean, and Rand does not mean, that everybody goes by reason all the time. Clearly, that is not the case. We know, you should pay attention to some politicians for a moment to see whether that's the case. So that's not what's meant by this. What's meant by it is that reason, our rational faculty, is what's distinctive about us, and it's our basic means of living. It's our basic means of living, the reasoning mind. Other animals have emotions, too. So emotion, we, emotions are not our means of living. They're very important. There are psychological means of enjoying our values. That, that's super important. We can talk about that. But they're not our means, they're not our basic means of living. Reason is, and why? Because reason is how we acquire knowledge. How do we figure out how to put things together so we can build a shelter? Or which berries are edible and which ones are not? Or how to build an iPhone, or a satellite, or a city, or a chair? or anything in between, right? We do it by using our five senses, observing the things in the world, forming concepts about what things are, dog, cat, animal, wood, saw, you know, and then enabling ourselves through these concepts to form thoughts and come up with ideas and then implement those ideas. We learn what things are, how we can use them, and how we can live by using our rational faculty. This is what we do. It's our basic means of survival, and it's our only means of knowledge. This is how we acquire knowledge. You can say that I get knowledge by just believing things, but on some level we kind of all know that's not true. Just to believe something doesn't make it true. We get knowledge by observing reality, forming concepts, forming generalizations on the basis of those concepts, and then you get full sentences, like the kind I'm speaking here, and everyone knows what I'm talking about because we all have this same faculty. This is what makes us distinctive. This is what makes us able to do the remarkable things that we do, whereas no other animals, including no other primates, can do this. So reason is our basic means of living. And then Rand says, great, so we see that people need to form judgments about the way that the world is, and then they need to act on those judgments in order to live. Because if, if you can't act on your judgment, if you can just sit there and think, let's say somebody puts you in a cage, so you can't act on your judgment, then you still can't live. So you need to be able to act on your judgment as well. It's not just that you, know, you can't sit around and think and then you live. You have to go out and you put your ideas to work. That has to, has to go together. Observing this fact about human beings, this very Aristotelian fact about human beings, Rand then asked, well, what's the one thing that can stop a human being from acting on his reasoning mind, from acting on his rational judgment? And she observes that that one thing is physical force. If you tie me to a tree and leave me there to die, and I can't get away, I can't act on my judgment, let's say I was going to go to the supermarket or go fishing this afternoon or whatever, I can't move, right? Your force has come between my thinking and my doing. I can't live. Likewise, if you stick a gun to my head and say, hey, you're going to do what I tell you or you're going to die, I don't really have a choice. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And if that's, you know, get in a cage or go do this thing or have a career that's not the one that you want, 
or whatever the case may be, then I can't act on my judgment. If you don't kill me, you just force me to do something, I might still be alive, but am I living as a human being? Am I living a human life? If you put a human being in a cage and leave him there and then feed him every once in a while, is he living a human life? No, this is why slavery is wrong, right? This is why it's, 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 it, you, you can't do that with people. So a human life is precisely a life guided by the judgment of one's own mind. Reason is our means of living. That's what it means to be a human being. So Rand observes that force, regardless of degree, retards our ability to act on the one thing that is our basic means of living, our reasoning mind. It doesn't matter whether the force is absolute, like tying me to a tree or putting me in a cage or shooting me in the head, or partial. If you come to me to buy a used car, and I say, yes, here's my used car, and I tell you that it has only 50,000 miles on the odometer, and I'd like $10,000 for it, um, and then I sell you the car and you drive away, but unbeknownst to you, it has 100,000 miles on it, so you didn't buy the car that you bargained for, but I got the money that we, uh, that we agreed to. You're not driving the car you bargained for and I physically have your money, and you physically do not have the thing you bargained for. That's called fraud. There's, this is illegal in, in, in all Western countries. You're not allowed to do that, and the reason is because you have violated my judgment and my judgment's ability to help me make decisions and live my life. I don't have the car that I bargained for, and I instead have an inferior car. So that too is force. There are different kinds of force. Some force is direct and some force is indirect. You've heard of laws against extortion and defamation and these kinds of things. They're all trying to get at the same idea that, hey, you're, you've done something that physically harms this person or physically dis, uh, separates him from his property. So Rand observes that force, whether it's direct or indirect, and regardless of its degree, is anti-life. It's against life. Because it's against the very thing that is our means of living. Our judgment and our freedom to act on it. With this observation, Rand says, in effect, there ought to be a law, right? You know, the, the cliche. But the idea here isn't there ought to be a law because we're not at the legal level. We're at the moral level still. There ought to be a principle. There ought to be a principle that says, given the kind of animal that we are and the fact that we use reason in order to live, no one should be able to use force to stop somebody from acting on his or her judgment. There is the principle of rights, right there, derived from facts by observation and logic. Rand's principle of rights is not from God, it's not mystical, it didn't come from the government, and it doesn't come from nature, we can't say how, or from supernature. It comes from observation, mental integration, and logic. And the way to think of it is this. The easiest way to get your head around this is, I think, to, to sort of hold it. The idea that rights come from nature has long been sort of the thing that, that people like to say. The problem with it is when you hear somebody like uh, 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 Jeremy Bentham called uh, inalienable rights, nonsense upon stilts. You ever heard that phrase from Jeremy Bentham? He was a famous utilitarian philosopher. He said it's nonsense upon stilts. Another philosopher, Al Alistair McIntyre, says of rights that they're just like witches and unicorns. Just like witches and unicorns. Why? Because there's the same amount of evidence supporting their existence. Show me where the rights are. Cut me open. See where they are. Are they out there? Where are they? If there's no evidence for them, why should anybody accept them? Just like why should you accept the existence of a witch or a unicorn? But we don't have to think of natural rights as being out there or in here, in the sense that we can go find them. Because rights are not physical things. They're ideas. But the fact that they're ideas doesn't make them wrong. Sarcasm is an idea. Logic is an idea. Love is an idea. Are these things not real? They're real. You just have to know what their reference are. You have to know what they're referring to. Here's what rights refer to. They refer to a fact about human nature and human life. 
They simply refer to the fact that in order to live fully as a human being, you have to be fully free to act on the thing that makes you human, your rational faculty, your, your means of living. So you can think of it this way. What we have here is a recognition, that's the in here part, there's an idea of a fact. What's the fact out there that we're recognizing? Human beings are a certain way, they actually live by means of reason. If you use force against them, they can't live that way. Therefore, given our nature, we need to ban force from social relationships. There's nothing magical about this, but think about how powerful this idea is. People in the liberty movement have been trying for hundreds of years to defend freedom on the basis of rights. But no one has been able to point out what rights are, where they come from, or how we know it. They've been saying, well, they come from God, or they come from government, or they come from nature, we know not how. Now, with Rand's theory of rights, we can very clearly and very concisely explain to people what rights are, where they come from, and how we know it. And it's not made up. It's objective. It's a fact that we live by means of reason. It's a fact that if we can't use and act on our rational judgment, we can't live as human beings. We can live as something less than a human being. I can live as a slave if you put me in a cage or put me on a leash or make me do things for you. But that's not living a human life. It's not living as the kind of being that we are. So my question to you is how much more powerful would the liberty movement be if everybody in the movement who was trying to defend freedom understood this theory of rights and put it to work? What if at every one of these kinds of conferences or events that you go to, either you or you or you or someone got up on stage and said, look, rights are real and I can tell you why they're real, which gives us moral certainty about the fact that we're right about this. We're not just making claims or arbitrary assertions about whether or not we have these things. We know we have them. We can prove that we have them. They're absolute. They're real. So think about it. This is Ayn Rand's theory of rights sort of in a nutshell. I've written um, a, an article that goes through all the things I've talked about tonight and more. You can find it just by Googling Ayn Rand's theory of rights. I think it's the first thing that will pop up. Uh, and that is at my uh, journal, The Objective Standard. I urge you also to read Ayn Rand's work on this, uh, her, her own work. Uh, she's got an essay titled Man's Rights, another one titled Collectivized Rights, um, and both of those essays are in uh, The Virtue of Selfishness and in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. So either of those books will have these essays. She's written some other stuff on rights as well, but those are the, those are the core uh, books. And with that, I'd love to uh, uh, spend some time with you guys taking questions. I'm sure there are questions about this. And uh, we'll start that now. Thank you. All right. All questions are good questions. So. And, and, and be critical of this theory. Let me, let me add one thing before we start the Q&A. You, you guys are in college, so this may be redundant. But in America, the college students don't know this, so I'll, I'll pretend I'm in America. You should challenge everything you hear. You should challenge everything you hear, and you should demand that it makes sense to your mind. What does it mean for something to make sense? It means just what that sounds like it means, that the idea makes it to the sensory level. You can see, in effect, or touch, in effect, the thing that we're referring to in some way. What does it mean to understand something? It means precisely what that sounds like it means, that you know what stands under the idea and connects it to reality, this place, the place we live in. That's what you should demand with your mind when a professor or a speaker or a writer starts telling you, here's my theory and why it's true. It should always be, okay, we'll see whether your theory is true. Where's the evidence? Where, 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 how does this make it to the sensory level? What stands under this idea and connects it to reality? If a speaker, a thinker, or a writer cannot tell you that, he or she doesn't know what they're talking about, or they're lying to you, or both. So when you read Rand, read her absolutely critically. Demand that her ideas make sense to you, uh, or don't accept them. 
and she would, she would advocate this herself. In fact, she did advocate this kind of thing herself. That's the whole point of the virtue that sits sort of in the middle of her ethics called independence, which means go by your own judgment of the facts, not, not other people's uh, strong feelings or opinions or whatever. So anyway, during the q and I'd like to, I mean, you know, be, be critical of this. Come at, come at these ideas hard. Don't just, don't just let any of this wash over you. All right, any questions? Yes. Ah, good. Well, uh, working. I believe it's philosophically inaccurate to distinguish. I think you just have to hold it closer to your mouth. I believe it's philosophically inaccurate to distinguish between reason, logic, and you divide the lines there. There is government, there is God, there is nature, and they are divided from their they stand on another side. There is logic and reason, and they do not come in contact with each other. I believe that uh, also God, also government and nature have their philosophical explanations, and they are intertwined with each other. For example, take Locke or any philosopher. Uh, I believe even, even Brandt would not distinguish so harshly that God is, for example, there is no logical reason in God and there is no logical reason in government. To say, for example, let's take government and look, uh, that there is some logic in government because it, uh, because it, rep, uh, it is better than this nature of God. Yeah, just a state of nature with no, no government at all, yeah. So, uh, that is my question. Is there, can I, can I, if I read Rand? Okay. If I read Rand, can I uh, find such deep philosophical discussion about, for example, the structure of the mind, structure of the history, for example, what you can find in Hegel? It does Rand discuss it in philosophical context? Okay, there, there was a whole different question at the end there than the beginning one. So let me, I'm going to start with the beginning one, which was, um, it sounds like I'm saying that Rand is saying that there's no reason in God or government or even nature, and I'm putting all of them on this side and saying reason is over here. Is that what I'm intending to do, and is that an accurate portrayal of Rand? No, and if I implied that in any way, then that was my error, so I shouldn't have done that. So let me correct that now. No, Rand does not say, well, of one of these, she's going to say there's no reason, and that would be God. But let's start with government, since you mentioned that first. So does Rand think that there's any reason in government? Well, what do you, it depends on what you mean by in government. There's a reason to have a government. You need a government because you need to have a central organization that controls the use of retaliatory force in a society. Otherwise, you have anarchism in which case everyone, it's every man for himself, which turns into little gangs until one of the little gangs gets big enough to take over the other little gangs, and then you have a dictatorship, which is not a good thing. So Rand was against anarchism. She was for government, but only for a government of a particular type, and that is a government that does one thing and only one thing, and that is ban the use of force from social relationships and then use retaliatory force, not the initiatory force, but a retaliatory force, only against people who have initiated force to stop them from doing it or to punish them from doing it. She, she certainly was for government and she thought there was a good reason to have government. She wasn't against government. She just, I didn't get into government tonight because I was mo mostly trying to talk about the foundation for rights. Once we understand that rights exist, then the question becomes, how do you defend these things? How do you protect them? And there, so I could give a whole other talk about government. So glad you asked that part of the question. Uh, Rand does not think that reason and nature are at odds with each other at all. Her whole point is that the way you understand nature is by using reason. 
You have to look at reality, integrate the things that you see, form concepts on the basis of those observations of nature, and that's how you learn all about nature, including the laws of nature, so, such as the laws of physics and, and, uh, and, and mechanics and engineering. And that's why we have satellites up in the sky, you know, helping us to, to film videos like this and send them all over the earth, because people figured out what's going on in nature through reason. So reason is our means of discovering nature properly. As for God, Rand says, and I agree with her, that there's simply no evidence for the existence of God. Uh, no one has ever provided any evidence. The few people who have made a, a, a good attempt at trying to prove that God exists, for instance, Thomas Aquinas, all of their efforts to prove God exists are fallacious, and they're, they're basically, they, they, they violate various fallacy, uh, they violate various principles of logic and therefore are logically fallacious and that's been demonstrated you know multiple times you don't have to you don't have to have objectivist concepts to 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 apply there so she definitely does not not regard god as existing um, but here's the great thing that a lot of people who might still feel like there's some reason to believe in god um rand's come up with not only a theory of rights that gets rid of the need for God, because you don't need God to give you rights if you can figure out why you have them right here with nature. And she also came up with a whole moral code, a whole morality that's based on the factual requirements of human life, and that's good for everyone. It's, 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 a, it's a morality about pursuing, gaining, and keeping your values rather than sacrificing and giving them up. As human beings, do we need to gain and keep values in order to live, or do we need to just give away all of our values in order to live, right? As soon as you put it that way, it's pretty clear that the idea of sacrificing as a virtue doesn't make any sense. Giving up your, your values for nothing. Now, if you give up a value in exchange for a value that you value more, if I, if I work hard to make money and then I go buy a car with the money, it's because I value the car more. That's a trade, both me and the guy I buy the car from gain. It's a win-win relationship. So her ethics is all about using your mind, being productive, trading value for value, and you get this great win-win relationship with the people you engage with, and we can all live by means of this beautiful ethics that's grounded in the requirements of life. Whereas if you embrace traditional ethics, the idea that, oh, you should sacrifice, give up your values, that's what makes you really good, is giving up your values which is what religion calls for. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. I mean, that's why Jesus is the paramount uh, image of, of, of Christian, of Christian uh, religion and, and the Christian ethics. Like, he really sacrificed, and that's why he's the best guy of all. But sacrificing isn't good because it's anti-life. It's bad to sacrifice. Bad to sacrifice yourself to others, and it's bad to sacrifice others to yourself. Both ways are bad because human life doesn't require human sacrifice. It requires thought, production, effort, trade, and freedom to do all those things. So you see, with, with Rand's ideas on this, the whole need of God as a basis for evidence, as, as a basis for morality, or as a basis for rights, just goes away. You don't, there's no need. And you can't prove he exists, so it, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing there um, to help you, even if you, you wanted some other angle on that. All right, other questions? Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, uh, as you mentioned before, she wasn't an anarchist. She was pro-government as long as government was uh, enforcing the protection of rights, right? But how did she choose what were the fundamental rights? So how did she choose which, law, which rights were more fundamental than the others and why? Like what were the criteria she chose by? Great question, great question. So how did Rand choose what are the fundamental rights? And this is a really great question. It'll also help to anchor everything that we just talked about. So in Rand's morality, she, di she, she discovers that the whole reason that we need values or morality or a code of values or any of that kind of stuff is because we're alive and we want to try to stay alive. We want to try to live. If you don't want to live, you don't need anything, let alone moral principles. You can just sit down and you'll die, right? If you do nothing for a while and you'll die. The whole reason we need moral principles or anything is so that we can 
do the things that can enable us to live and enjoy our lives. That's what it's all about. So life, according to Rand, is the fundamental principle of ethics. Well, the founders, the American founders, had already talked about life at the level of rights. They said your fundamental right is the right to life. This perfectly corresponds with Rand's ethics. The fundamental value in Rand's ethics is your life, right? So fundamental value, life, your right to the fundamental thing that matters, your life. Now we'll take liberty. What is the right to liberty? It's the right to act on your judgment, specifically your rational judgment. Now, you're free to act on irrational judgment, too, if you want, as long as you don't hurt other people doing that, according to the theory of rights. You're free to do whatever you want. You just can't harm other people. So the freedom to act on your rational judgment corresponds again to one of Rand's fundamental principles. What is our basic means of living? Reason. That's right at the base of her ethics. The goal of ethics is to live and, and love your life, live and flourish. Your basic means of achieving that goal is your reasoning mind. Take property, the right to property. What is the right to property? It's the right to produce, keep, and use and dispose of the things that you make, right? You make something, it's yours. You produce a business, it's yours. You earn a paycheck, it's yours. Whatever the case may be, if you and your effort got the thing, it belongs to you. This corresponds also to one of Rand's fundamental principles. She identifies the fact that as human beings, we have to be productive. We have to produce in order to live. So one of her basic virtues is the virtue of productiveness. This idea that if you want to live, you have to make stuff. Well, that's true, obviously. If you, 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 you can't have values if you don't produce the values. So she then looks at this right to property and she's like, yep. Because you have to produce values in order to live, and because you need to be able to use those values once you've produced them, you have to have a right to do that thing, the right to property. Finally, the right to happiness. Again, it corresponds to one of Rand's fundamentals. The whole fundamental of Rand's ethics is that your life belongs to you, your mind belongs to you, the things you produce belong to you, and because all of this belongs to you, you get to decide what you want to do with your life, what will make you happy. This is why she called her ethics egoism. Egoism is the idea that it's morally right for you to act on your judgment. It's morally right for you to choose the goals and values that will make your life great. Right to the pursuit of happiness? It's right there. It's right there in her fundamental ethics, right? So in each case, Rand had discovered a fundamental principle that corresponded perfectly with the rights that the founders and other rights theorists had been talking about. Why are they fundamental? So that's how she did it. But now we just ask, why are these fundamental? The only reason we need anything is if we want to live. There's the right to life. The only reason we need to act on reason is if we want to live. But if we want to live, we have to act on reason. That's reciprocal in that direction, right? So there's your right to to liberty and why that's fundamental. Right to property, you can't live if you can't produce and have the stuff that you produced. It's a fact, it's not, a, it's not an opinion. She didn't just like pull these out of the air. They're literally things that we can see are true. And the right to the pursuit of happiness goes essentially in the same way. In order to live as a human being fully, to flourish, think about what flourish means, right? If a flower is flourishing, what does it mean? It means its petals are blooming and everything's looking beautiful on it, right? If you see a flower and it's wilting and it's all hanged, you know, lurching over and, and looking like it's dying, you don't say it's flourishing or thriving. The same thing is true of any animal or plant, right? There's a certain kind of thing that it is. And when it's living fully in accordance with its nature, you can tell, right? You can see that it's a tiger, when it's really doing well, is looking great. When it's all mangy and dying, not so much. A human being, we know what it means on some level to live fully as a human being, right? It's when you get up in the morning, you have a, a job you love to do, you have purposes in life, you've got these relationships that you're building. They may not all be perfect, but you're working on them and you love what you're doing and you're, you have enough income coming in to take care of yourself. That's called thriving. That's what happiness is. And according to Rand, we all get to design our own lives and create our own happiness because we have different things we like to do. I like to do the thing I'm doing here. You might like gardening. You might want to be a lawyer or a doctor or an actor or whatever. 
But whatever you want to do, that's your thing. So the, the right to the pursuit of happiness is very important, that word pursuit. You don't have a right to be happy, because then somebody would, you know, would have to make you happy, it would seem. But you have a right to do whatever you want with your mind and your decisions to go after these things. And that, according to Rand, is what's a fully, fully flourishing human life. And who doesn't want that, right? How, I mean, how beautiful, when you think about it this way, you see these correlations between Rand's fundamental ideas and the rights that, that, we, that we have, but, but that not many people know why we have them. You see that we have these things and what facts give rise to them. And then when you think about, well, what's not to like here? So everybody gets to, to, to act in, in accordance with his or her judgment, have, build a beautiful life, and forces out of, out of the equation. Nobody's allowed to use force, and we all get to thrive and flourish. This is what Rand's philosophy is about. This is why we, my, my organization, Objective Standard Institute, our tagline is philosophy for freedom and flourishing. If you have these ideas, and if we can help to spread them, you see how clear it all is. If we can help to spread these ideas, and it's like, oh my God, let's do this thing called living and flourishing. Let's just all do it, instead of only pockets of the world getting to do it, you know? So, gr great question. I hope that was not, well, probably too long an answer, but anyway. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. As I promised, I have a few questions for today. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, you mentioned the difference between natural rights uh, and God-given rights and government rights, yes? Uh, in fact, many scholars attribute rent to the school of natural rights, uh, and they have strong arguments about this. In fact, according to rent, if rights come from uh, objective reality, why cannot reality be called nature? What is the difference between nature and object objective reality? Okay. So what is the difference between nature and objective reality with respect to this idea of rights? So Rand says that rights come from reality, and, uh, and I'm sort of juxtaposing that idea with the idea of natural rights. And it's the idea, why can't we say that they come from nature? I think you can say that they come from nature. A good friend of mine and I have sort of a bit of a debate on this, because he says, yes, it's true that in the history of natural rights theory, the thinkers were actually thinking about supernatural rights, right? They were, they, they were using the word natural, but they meant that they came from God, so it's really not natural. Th that's my problem with using the concept of natural rights to name Ayn Rand's theory of rights. Even though, if that history had not been there, I think the word natural would be just fine. But I prefer this, and I, this may, may satisfy you, my friend, it does not satisfy. I prefer to say, look, let's make a distinction. Since natural rights is all tied up with this idea of supernatural rights in, in the history of the ideas, let's call Rand's theory objective rights. Objective meaning that it's a recognition, that's the in here part, of a fact that we can observe and see and integrate. So I like that idea. Rand didn't call her theory natural rights, and she didn't call it objective rights. She just said, here's my theory of rights, and here are the facts that support it. So she, if she had had a preference on this, I would say, hey, let's go with her preference. She didn't seem to have a preference, and she only used the phrase natural rights once, to my knowledge, and it was in the 40s, while she was still developing her early ideas. Then she abandoned that and never used it again, and I suspect that it's because she understood that if you, if you say this is a theory of natural rights, it's going to get all messed up in people's minds with John Locke's theory and the Founders' theory. But it really is distinct from theirs, because she's showing the facts that give rise to this thing, not just saying that they're there. And she's certainly not saying they come from God. So I think that's, you know, you, you, nature and reality are effectively the same thing, A, for that part of your question. And as for why there's any distinction here between nature and objective or nature and fact-based in this rights idea, I'm making a bit of a distinction there because I think it's easier to keep track of what you're thinking about if you have a distinct idea for Rand's concept. Does that help? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. First of all, thank you so much. And my question uh, is connected with uh, the concept of human rights uh, by Ayn Rand and uh, COVID-19 regulations in the whole world. Well, um, we saw that even super democratic countries um, impose the obligations 
that were violating the human rights, especially during curfews. Uh, but for example, Sweden was one of the countries, a few countries that let people to leave as they used to, uh, even before COVID-19. And um, my question is, will it be right to say as a conclusion um, that democracy nowadays uh, becomes just, let's say so, a tool uh, to guarantee the existence of a true value of uh, human rights, then a governing, uh, uh, then a governing system that actually practically defends human rights. Okay. From the concept of um, Ayn Rand, I'm, I, I wanted yep. to make the comparison between the regulation that we have and the concept of Ayn Rand. Great. Okay. Let me restate the question just to make sure that I have it clear, because yes. you, yep. you have a bit of an accent and I just, I'm not very good at tracking them. So let me just make sure I have this. So um, w would, would I say that democracy is a tool or a, or a political ideal for protecting rights and that that's what we should be fighting for? for and then you mentioned some COVID contexts where I take it the idea was that they, they had a more democratic approach to, uh, to dealing with COVID, for instance. Oh, oh no? No, I said that the majority of countries, even the super democratic countries, <laughs> were violating the rights of, uh, were right, or violating the democratic value and uh, the human rights. But ah. the Sweden was one of the few countries, okay. which is also super democratic, but y it depended. Uh, human rights because it led people to live as they used to before COVID-19. Got it. Now, now it's clear. So, um, so given that the, the so-called democratic countries seemed to lock down on this stuff too, with, with one or two exceptions basically, and so it seems like there's some conflict between the idea of democracy and the protection of rights. Yeah, there's a big, big conflict between democracy and the pr protection of rights, and Rand was not an advocate of democracy. Uh, not as a governmental system. She, she appreciated the democratic process within a constitutional republic where you get to choose, you get to elect your representatives, right? That's, but that's a democratic process. That's different than a democracy. The idea there being that there's going to be majority rule. That's what democracy means uh, historically is majority rule. Well, majority rule is just another form of tyranny. So just, we'll get to the COVID thing in a minute, but just let's just back up for a minute and think about what democracy means. 51% of the population, the majority, gets to tell the other 49% of the population the way that things are gonna be. That's not gonna bring freedom to, that's not, that's not respecting rights, that's somebody lording it, that's a group, a big group, lording it over a smaller group. Rand didn't advocate this, nor did the founding fathers. The founder, all of the American founders were against democracy. They came, they wrote explicitly against democracy, they condemned democracy, and they said, we are not setting up a democracy, we're setting up a constitutional republic in which there will be elections where you get to elect your leaders. It's a very different thing. And almost everybody sort of misuses this term today. Even American politicians and professors of law and, and the like call America a democracy. It's not a democracy, it's a constitutional republic, or at least it's supposed to be. So now, when we think about COVID lockdowns, and the way that so many states handled this by you know, saying, oh, there's a pandemic, you have to stay home, your business is not essential, so you, get to, you go under, your business is essential, so we're gonna let you stay open or whatever. All of this top-down stuff, the whole of it was a violation of rights. And I mean the whole of it. Here's what a government should do when a pandemic like that comes around. Zero, not a damn thing. The marketplace will take care of this. Individuals in the marketplace will decide for themselves, hey, well, first of all, when you don't tell individuals that your, your lords over here who allegedly know everything are gonna tell everybody what to do and save the day, when you say, no, you're on your own, guess what people tend to do? They go, oh, so I have to think. Yes, you do, everybody has to think. So then what we do is we think. And you know what happens when individuals think? They, they take care of themselves pretty damn well. So everybody's context is different. Let's say that I have real problems like asthma or, um, you know, or, or, or diabetes, or I'm, I'm in one of these, uh, these categories of people who could be really, really negatively affected by COVID. 
and I find out that, oh, there's a, there's a pandemic going around, what should I do? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. Stay away from this stuff. Put on a mask if you have reason to believe that a mask will help. Um, you know, stay out of big crowds where you might catch this thing or whatever. Likewise, if you have a, a, a grandparent or a parent who's in one of these categories, you might say, what should I do about mom and dad? Oh, well, they're, they're in a high risk category. Let's make sure that they're out of the way, right? All of us would do exactly this if the government stayed the hell out of our way and let us make our own decisions. We'd say, what's my context? What, do I will it, what am I willing to risk for myself? You know, in my case, I'm super healthy, I'm relatively young. I didn't even worry about COVID. If I got COVID, it was going to be essentially like the, the flu and a little bit worse. And I did get it, and it was essentially like the flu and frankly, not really much worse. It was basically like that for me. So in, in my view, what should have happened is the government should have done literally nothing and everybody should have been on their own, and I think we would have been out of this thing essentially a long time ago. I, I think the lockdowns were so much worse than the disease itself. Think about all the businesses that went under. Think about all the money and the, and the value and the wealth that was lost. Think about all the kids who became depressed and what they did. Some of them turned to drugs, some of them committed suicide. Think about all the kids who were locked in their homes with their parents who normally get some distance from their kids. Now they didn't. Frustrations built. Children were abused either physically or, or, or intellectually or both. And it goes on and on and on. You know Frederick Bastier's statement about the seen and the unseen in economics where you know there are things you see happening in the world and then there are all the unseen effects. The unseen effects of the lockdowns are massive. And we are going to be feeling those reverberations for decades to come. Think, I'll give you one more example of that and then I'll, I'll get off this subject because I start to, my head will start to smoke on this. Um, when you put masks over children at the kindergarten level for two and a half years and they don't get to see other people's facial expressions and the empathy that they gain from seeing facial expressions and all the learning that goes on through facial expressions, do you think for a moment that that will not have any consequence on that child's development? I mean, come on. This is, this is huge. This, this one thing, just you, and, and, we, and I could bring in eight, 18 to 20 more on this level. That is gonna have massive repercussions when children cannot see and develop empathy at a young age, do you know what the definition of a sociopath is? Someone who lacks empathy. You, the, 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 all of these things were bad and the governments did them all. So back to Rand. Rand. Rand is not here to say what her view of the pandemic was. She did say at one point that if there is some kind of a, of a really deadly disease, like if, let's take smallpox, something that if you get it, you're basically gonna die right, or Ebola or something like that. If you have that, you certainly don't have any right to march down the streets in Manhattan, you know, coughing and sneezing. That's a different thing. But that's not lockdowns. That's saying of the, of the, of the person, hey, you don't have a right to do that, so don't do it. And guess what? How many times when you get the flu do you go to the supermarket and start sneezing on the vegetables, right? Nobody, people are responsible. We don't do that. So you don't need the government telling you what to do there. A temporary lockdown in an, in an area where you think that there's something like Ebola has gotten out and you just, you know, the government gets on the horn and says, in effect, hey, stay in your homes. We think there's a problem out here. If you've got a temporary lockdown like that with, a, you know, with, a, with an end in sight and there's a really specific purpose for it, I can see that as a, as a legitimate measure, right? But, but that's a very different thing than, we're gonna flatten the curve, oh, and then after, well, now we're not gonna flatten the curve, we're gonna do this other thing, and then it goes on and on and on for two years. So I think Rand would have been appalled by all of this. I think she would have said essentially the same, I can't speak for her, but I think she would have said essentially the same thing I'm saying, which is human beings have a mind, they have their context, and they can take care of themselves, get out of their way and let them do that, and then they will take care of themselves. So. D democracy is a bad thing, not a good thing, and I think, un unfortunately, a lot of people think that these, these, these uh, better nations, like, like America and some of these other nations that still call themselves democracies, are democracies. 
if they were really democracies, they'd be saying it's 51% rule and, and that's it. If, are they really saying that or are they something else? Most, economy, most economies are a mixed mess because nobody's thinking in principles. So you get a bunch of politicians who are like, let's stack this piece onto it and this law and this regulation and we'll let the other people do these things but not those people do these things. And it's just a big chaos. And I don't think it, you, it, that's not a democracy. It's, it, it, the, the best, the, the, the technical term for it is political mayhem. Right, it's just, it's just a mess. That's what's going on in America right now, I can tell you that. America, which used to be a shining hill on, on, you know, for everybody to see, like, hey, let's do that thing. Everyone, in, not everyone, but a huge number of people in America are like, hey, this freedom thing wasn't so good, let's try socialism again. It's not like uh, that's been tried anywhere. So we're, we're trying that now, and, um, and it's insane. So I, I would say don't use democracy. Instead, try to specify what's really going on in a given government and say, well, what you really have here is a bunch of pressure groups doing things and a little bit of voting here and there and a huge dictatorial umbrella coming down from the top. Not really democracy. Um, it, it, it's something else. Question, sir? Yes. One more? All right. Two, can we take two more? Can we take two more? Each, each guy with the mic? Okay, go ahead. I had, you already, you've already asked a question tonight, yes? Yes. Yeah, let, let me defer to the gentleman who has not, and then we'll go to, to your question next if we have time. Okay. I hope we will. Thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, my question is, as I understood uh, the basic rights of, and rights as freedom, is that uh, just any individual may feel that uh, the basic freedom is to have access to anywhere which is created by nature, let's say the to forest, to lake, let's say. I want to go to a certain lake, it's created by nature, right? I should have that right. And um, there is, on the other hand, there is the rights of uh, property. Somebody may say that that lake is my own. So I just restrict your right to get there, or, or, or uh, the forest, or, or any other natural uh, feature. And when uh, there is such a conflict between two rights, according to the theory, so uh, which right will, pre uh, will prevail and how uh, we normally should regulate and uh, who should regulate those conflicts between those rights? Yeah, great question. Okay, so I'll repeat it. So. Um, the idea is that n nature, given that it's you know not necessarily created by us, things out like a, a pond or a lake or a mountain or whatever, is just out there, and it seems that we should have a right to go enjoy that, since it's it's nature and we're here on this earth. Um, but what if somebody says, well, this is my property? So he's put up a fence around some area and says, this is my property, and is there a conflict here between these claims of rights? So there's not a conflict, but, there, but this, takes some, this takes some thinking and some uh, thinking both about rights and about politics and how to integrate these things. The right to property is not the right to, to go like land on a continent and say, oh, there's nobody here. I claim the whole continent. It's mine. And then somebody comes on the other side of the continent and gets on and you're like, oh, you can't be on this land, it's mine, right? That would be absurd. And the reason it would be absurd is because, I mean, it's, it's clearly absurd, but then we want to get to what's the principle that makes it absurd. The whole point of property rights, of this, the idea of having a right to property, is so that you can use the thing within the scale of what potential human use there is and, and thrive and, and live your life by using it, right? So you don't have a right to something just because your toe hit the continent first. You have a right to land if nobody else is using it, if nobody else has claimed it yet. You have a right to claim the land if you can put that portion of the land to actual use. And in America, they had what was called the Homesteaders Act early in the formation of the country. And what happened was there was a bunch of unused land, un unclaimed land, out in western United States. And the government basically said, if you go and homestead out that way, that's why it's called the Homesteaders Act, and you, you, you put up a fence around a property and turn that property into a value, 
because it's not a value until somebody's done something with it. So if you plant crops or, or put cattle in and start using it for grazing or whatever, and you turn it into a value, then that property will be yours. And that's a good model for what I think makes sense. If property is not yet owned, now once property is, is owned, when somebody owns property, if you own a beautiful pond and you're taking care of it, and I'm like, hey, there's some nature, I'm gonna go swim in his pond, you could say to me, no, this is, this is my property, so you know, not without my permission. And I think that's, that, that, that makes sense. Um, but if you go to the edge of an ocean and say, well, I'm claiming this ocean, you see the absurdity of that. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think the best way to think about property is that property is a principle involving use value of the thing that you're claiming and the actual use of that thing. Think about if somebody goes to Mars and gets first and he touches Mars and he says, the whole planet is mine. And then somebody else lands on the other side of the planet and starts to maybe colonize over there. And the guy comes marching around. I don't know how that long that would take him a while. But he'd get over there and he'd say, you can't be here because I touched this place before you did. It's just absurd. The point of property rights is not to make claims on huge things that you can't do anything with. The point of property rights is to say, hey, I'm using this thing and I'm using it to support my life. So I need the protection of, of that. And it does, does that make sense? I mean, there's more I could say about this because then there's the question a lot of people have about like government and property and should all, Ayn Rand held that all property should be private precisely for this reason, that public property becomes, well, if it's public, it means everybody owns it and nobody owns it kind of at the same time. What does that mean? Can I go do anything I want on public property? Can I do nothing on public property? As soon as it's private, as soon as it belongs to a specific person or a company, it's like, okay, we get to say what's going to happen on it. And that just makes more sense. Um, so I, I guess, is, it, is that helpful? Or did I oh, open thanks, a sir. can of worms and make more questions? It's good, okay. Uh, any more? Did you have one more or are we done? All right. Uh, I have more three, but I will ask you one of them. Uh, uh, Mr. Craig, I have no question about uh, human rights, but I have a question about classical liberalism or objectivism. May I ask? Sure. Uh, in the postmodern reality, the neoliberal economic setup ignores radical ideas such as classical liberalism or radical socialism. Mm, take uh, objectivism, for example. Uh, I am uh, I am an objectivist, uh, or I'm trying to be objectivist, I'm really trying hard. Uh, objectivism as a philosophical doctrine has changed my personality and my life. Uh, but let's look at it from the perspective of the social sciences. Uh, is objectivism relevant to a postmodern arrangement? Uh, I'm interested in uh, politics, uh, not in uh, philosophical uh, from not philosophical vision, I, uh, I'm interested in politics. In today's global world, what will be the consequences if we make everything uh, private and abolish taxes? Will such a regime withstand destruction today? Uh, I mean, um, is objectivism relevant for... Uh yeah, so I got the question. It, yeah, so is, is, is objectivism really relevant in, in the current day in politics, given that there aren't, you know, there aren't very many people who advocate it, A, uh, and then you, you mentioned classical liberalism, for instance, which is something akin to objectivism. They're so, I think they belong in sort of the same sphere in the sense that classical liberals are for rights and therefore freedom. They don't fully grasp, per se, what Rand's ideas on these are. And I think her ideas could come in and really support what classical liberals want to do, but are not doing very well. So I think there's a connection there. But to your question of is objectivism relevant? Well, it depends on what you mean by relevant. Uh, it's certainly relevant in the sense that Rand has answers to questions that people need if they want to live well and advance their lives and, and defend liberty. She came up with an understanding of rights that we can see is true. Like you really can get your head around it and we can demonstrate that it's true. So it's super relevant in the sense that we need these ideas and we can explain them to people and Rand has done a beautiful job of explaining them to us. So that's, there's, it's relevant in that sense. 
if by relevant do you mean, does it, d does it stand a chance of actually, do we stand a chance today or anytime soon of actually instituting pure laissez-faire capitalism, a social system in which the only thing the government does is protect individual rights and other, other than that, people are free to do what they want. That's not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, for sure, unfortunately, but this is the way the world works. Uh, ideas, you know, politics is downstream from ethics and deeper philosophy. So we've got to change people's thinking on these ideas before their ideas are going to come around to, oh, capitalism and genuine freedom really do make sense. There are facts that support this idea. To get people there, they have to hear the kind of things we're talking about tonight. That's, that's how they're going to get their head around it. So um, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a long time before we have that kind of society, but that doesn't mean we can't make progress. Everything historically, in terms of historic change, is done by little steps at a time. Occasionally some big step happens, like the founding of America. You know, then, then you get a big step, it's like, whoa, that, that's a sea change that, that somebody founded a country based on the idea of individual rights. But most of the steps are small and it's incremental. What we want to do is move in the right direction incrementally. And the way to do that is to understand these ideas, help to spread the ideas, and then hopefully more and more people will, will embrace them. So relevant, definitely. Uh, likely to, to come around fully anytime soon? Absolutely not. There's just no, there's just no way that that's going to happen. But the, the good news is we don't need to fix everything all at once to make things better. We can make things better one step at a time. And you don't need to have a perfect laissez-faire society to build a beautiful life. It would be better to have that. You could, you could do more to build a beautiful life if we had that society. But we have to work within the society we're in. So my advice to you is not only fight for freedom on, on these proper grounds, but design your life according to your values and live it fully the best that you can. You have this one life. Make it good. Make it great. To hell with good. I shouldn't have said that. Bad speaker. Make your life awesome, right? Go out there and do, go, seriously, go out, you know, make, do, do the very best thing you can to design a life that you love and, 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 and pursue that and live it. That's what, that, this is the, if I gave another talk, it would be all about Rand's ethics and that's what her ethics are all about doing, so. Yeah. Thank you all.